Thank you for coming in from outside, from the beautiful sunshine. I did ask if we could do this last presentation by the pool, um, but apparently there's some health and safety regulation about electricity and water that means we can't. Um, though there may still be some unintended comedy in this presentation, because at some point I'm bound to trip over one of these tables and knock the water flying. So I will place it carefully and try not to do that. So today I'm going to talk about how you can unlock the power of digital to win the battle for attention. So why is this important? Well, as exemplified by this guy, there are a lot of things to look at these days, a lot of things to give attention to, smartphones more than anything. Now, I want to hazard a guess, this guy is probably a millennial. Um, he's out on a lovely boat trip, and I'm not sure what that creature is, but I hope it's not a shark. Um, he's obviously not noticed it, he's so engrossed with his smartphone. So what, why is that? Because consumers now have more media choices than ever before. So getting their attention is harder for brands than it ever has been. There are many more ways to get attention and many more methods to do so, but to actually distract people from all the other options that they have is a tough thing to do. We've got some stats here that the average American now spends more time online per day than they do watching TV. So they spend 5.6 hours online every day. They spend 4.6 hours watching TV. That's more than doubled in the past five to six years. Uh, similarly, there was a stat earlier about the amount of content uploaded to YouTube every minute. The latest data I saw was that there are 400 hours of content uploaded to YouTube every minute. And obviously, it's multi-screening driving this, the amount of mobile devices, the fact that people can do two things, at, two things at once, or even three things at once. And mobile is really prevalent. Mobile, we're living in an increasingly mobile-first world. 87% of Facebook accounts are now accessed on mobile. Around 50% still on desktop, but 87% on mobile. Again, a US stat, 51% of time spent on digital media in the US is mobile. And in fact, in many emerging markets, that figure's been superseded already. So in fact, in Turkey, 66% of time spent online is on mobile. That's similar to India. Nigeria is even higher at 76%. And you have places like Indonesia and South Africa not far behind. So in many cases, some people have gone straight from having no online They've missed desktop entirely and they've gone straight to mobile. So mobile first is really where we're at today. And just to kind of prove that point in Turkey, some of the latest data that we have suggests that smartphone penetration in Turkey has doubled almost in the past two years. So from 37 to 66 percent from 2013 to 2015. And of those people, 70 percent of them say that they multi-screen. They use their smartphones at the same time that they're watching TV. So multi-screening and getting attention is really difficult. And while that's all going on, there's so much things people can give their attention to, people are also actively trying to avoid ads. You only need to go onto the average website these days and see how you get bombarded by advertising, how some websites can have three, four, five different ads running at the same time. So what are people trying to do? They're trying to block them. Around a quarter of smartphone owners are now downloaded ad blocking apps. I think the stat for Turkey is around 5%, but this is coming. It's going to grow and it's going to get higher. 25% of smartphone owners blocking ads. 80% of skippable YouTube ads are skipped. So the ads where you see the first five seconds, then you have a choice to skip. 80% of those ads, of those ad impressions, are skipped before the ad gets to the end. And even in other fields outside of communication, in e-commerce, it's been researched that a two-second delay in choosing your products and going to the transaction page can cause a 25% dropout in the transaction. So people abandon the page because they feel that two seconds is too long to wait. Research from Microsoft recently has come out. They say that the average human attention span, they estimate, has fallen from 12 to 8 seconds. I believe this is when people are online. Um, so kind of a third drop within about uh, 10 years. A bit worrying because apparently the average goldfish has an attention span of about 9 seconds. So uh, we're not even as good as that now. So maybe that's a bit tongue-in-cheek, maybe that's not a serious statistic, but these are. These are from our brand tracking and from our ad tracking. So when we run campaign research, we show people stills from ads that have been on TV or online, uh, we, from video ads. We de-brand them and we ask people, have you seen this ad before and do you know which brand it was? So people's ability to do that, to recognize and attribute the brand to an ad, is falling. So what we have is three different levels of spend, from low spend at 500 TLPs up to 1,000. In each case, over five years in the UK, we've seen a drop in the average level of branded TV ad recognition 
for the same level of spend that we had five or six years ago. So we see a similar pattern elsewhere. I don't have the figures for Turkey, but we see this in Spain. So again, and you notice it's getting higher as the level of spend gets higher as well. So what we think ha is happening here is two things. One is multi-screening, so people are just paying less attention to the TV while it's on. But as spend increases, then the chances that you've seen that ad already are greater. The frequency increases as well. So people, as, as there's greater frequencies, people think, oh, I've seen that ad before, I'm not going to watch it. So the level of branded TV ad recognition is falling. And this is a serious problem for advertisers. They're spending the same amount of money, they're getting less benefit for it. Same pattern in France. Even more prevalent at the high end as well. So what can you do about this? How can you win the battle for attention? Well, I'm going to look at three different areas, three different ways that you can do that. The first is to make the first five seconds count, reach the right audience, and then measure the metrics that matter. So making the first five seconds count, what do we mean by that? Well, the global chief marketing officer of Unilever, Keith Weed, recently said that it's no longer what's the greatest idea you've got, but what's the greatest idea you've got in five seconds. You really have to get people's attention fast. You have to grip them. You have to give them a reason to stick with you, to stay with your ad, to stay with your content. If you don't catch their attention quickly online, there are too many other choices. They will go somewhere else. So why is that? Well, just looking at where people spend most of their time online, on social networks, Twitter, Facebook, wherever it might be, people scroll very quickly through their news feeds. You must know yourself how quickly you're flicking through for something to catch your attention. It has to be really good. It has to really mean something to you. Facebook themselves have presented research that says young people actually scroll through their news feeds faster than old people. So it's even more of a challenge amongst millennials. They've also, interestingly, even been able to measure that people whose phone batteries are running low scroll faster than people who have a lot of battery power left. People are trying to make the most of their time. 85% um, of Facebook video ads are actually watched with the sound off. So this is video advertising that people are not turning the sound on for. So on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, video ads in your feed play automatically, but they play automatically without sound. Sound only comes on if you tap or click the ad, the vast majority of people don't do that. They're not interested. So again, if the ad doesn't really capture people's attention straight away, give them a reason to activate the sound, they're moving on. And if you're relying on sound in that ad, then you're not going to have any impact. And as mentioned, 80% of TrueView ads are skipped. So we did a study with Google recently where we looked at 6,000 TrueView ads across 16 different countries and 11 industries. And we coded these ads up against 170 different creative attributes. So, was there a celebrity in the ad? Was the product featured? Was there a logo? Was the logo on the product? Was there a baby scene? Was there a family scene? Was there a dog? 170 different creative attributes that go into the ad. The things that kept people watching and why they did not skip were things like humor, suspense, emotion, and celebrities. So if those things were present in the first five seconds, people stuck with, with the ad and they watched it through potentially to the end or at least a lot longer than otherwise. The biggest driver of skipping, if it appeared in the first five seconds, was branding. Bit of a problem for advertisers. It's kind of the point. So what can we learn from this? Well, a few things. One is that as well as having a short period of time to get attention, you can create impact within a short period of time. So this is data that Facebook released recently. Um, they're looking at three different measures, ad recall, brand awareness, and purchase intent. Across the bottom, you've got the time or the length of the ads. Up the top, you've got the percent of the impact, the percent of the uplift that occurred to the brand. So um, brand consideration or, sorry, brand recall or awareness that was driven by that. What they're saying is that around a half to a third of the impact of a Facebook video ad occurs within the first three seconds. And around three quarters of the impact occurs after 10 seconds. So you really don't need long ads. You can accomplish the lift within a short period of time if your ad is good enough and if it optimizes to the first few seconds. When it comes to skipping, yes, people skip ads. They're more likely to skip if the brand is present in the first five seconds. But we also found in that study that the biggest driver of impact for the brand, the biggest driver of an ad having awareness, brand, uh, driving uplift in brand consideration and purchase intent, was having the brand in the first five seconds. So it's a kind of double-edged sword. You have the brand present, people might skip. But you have the brand present, you're going to get more brand impact. So what do you do? I think the key is that you need to make the brand part of the story, inherent to the content, but not just kind of pushing the logo in people's faces to say, this is an ad, you know, and so they immediately skip. 
So an example here from the game Mario Kart. They went to what's supposedly the crookedest or windiest street in the world in San Francisco. They had an ad where characters came down in, dressed as the Mario characters down the street to advertise the Mario Kart game. They didn't need to put the logo up front because people recognized what it was. The brand was part of the story. It wasn't an ad with a brand slapped at the beginning. So having the brand really inherent to the content is really important. And of course, optimization. We do have advertisers who take TV ads and they put them straight online and think they might work the same. They don't, particularly when it's skippable. Um, it's a different context. People, people have the opportunity to skip, which means slow builds or reveals. They don't work. People don't wait until the end to find out what the dramatic thing is going to be. It's too late. So you need to capture them early. I recently tested an ad for a client which was brilliant on TV. It worked really well. But the brand didn't appear until the 20th second and the product until the 26th. When, we ran it, when they ran it as a skippable ad, it was terrible. It had no impact whatsoever because 80% of people had skipped before they even knew who the advertiser was. So you need to optimize ads to the right context. The Internet Advertising Bureau, the IAB, also recommends that brands use more interactive and engaging ad formats. They have ad formats they've called the rising stars. So you can look up online to find out what the rising stars are. But these are some of them. They're essentially ad formats that are more interactive. They do more. They're more creative. There's more for people to do with them. And they're more enjoyable and more engaging. So the research that they've released says that these ads drive higher ad recall. They have better interaction. People look at them longer. And also, they have a better impact on the brand itself. Crucially also, people f find them much less annoying. So they're much less likely to want to skip or install an ad blocker if it's good quality advertising versus just being bombarded with banners and so forth. And of course, when it comes to research and testing, this really means we have to test ads in context. So at Ipsos, we use a multimedia environment to test our ads or we deliver them live on Facebook or live online and test them in that environment because that's where you're going to get the real understanding of how this ad works in context versus if you just put it in the middle of a survey with survey questions around it, you'll get a very different reaction to that ad. So we test in context. And it comes to reaching the right audience. Well, a lot of brands want to create viral advertising. You know, it's the perfect way to run an ad campaign. You don't have to spend much money. You create a viral ad, but it's not easy. This is a quote from a YouTube star who has nearly 3 million subscribers who says that to say I want to make a viral movie is like a musician saying I want to make a hit song. Everyone wants to do it, but it's not easy. There's no formula, and it's not an easy thing to do. And not very many people do interact with, with ads, if we're honest. We might like or hope that they do, but there's research that says that for brands with over a million Facebook fans, just 0.06% of them interact with the average Facebook post. So that means like, share, or comment. So it's not an easy thing to do, but it can be done. And we know some of the factors that can help advertising be shared and go viral. So at Ipsos, we have facial coding. Um, we work with our partner, Realize. And what we've learned from that is where they have a, score, a score they call the emotional score, which combines four different emotions from the facial coding. And that has a very strong correlation with online sharing. So on Facebook, a strong correlation with social shares, on YouTube, social views, and on Twitter with tweets if an ad has a strong, positive emotional reaction. That's the type of content that gets shared, not ads that are very persuasive or have a new product or have a discount, stuff that really makes people care, stuff that touches them, and stuff that drives their emotions. That's what works. Programmatic advertising can also work as well. We can reach the right audience by using programmatic to target very particular people who exhibit certain behaviors, or maybe they appear to be in the window for a, a car, perhaps, because they're searching for a car, they're visiting car websites. You can use programmatic to target specifically those people. Um, so that can reach the right people. We did this with a client recently, Birdseye, who've allowed us to share the example. They had an ad for Birdseye Fish Fingers. The idea was that many people in the UK might buy a pack of fish fingers, they use some of them, then they leave it at the back of the freezer and forget that it's there. They wanted to remind people when they were hungry, that maybe they have fish fingers in the house, maybe they should consider a snack, a fish finger sandwich in this case. Um, a very kind of British type of food, if you like. Um, so the idea was what they did, they ran the campaign between 5 p.m. and 11 p.m. at night. They targeted young people, young people who appeared to have active social lives based on the things that the websites they visited, so they could programmatically target people who are likely to have just come in from a night out or come back from somewhere with friends and be hungry. 
Um, and what we found was we used mobile research to interview these people between 5 and 11 at night. We asked them if they were hungry or not. And when they'd been exposed to the ad, people who were hungry were three times more likely to say they wanted to eat fish fingers now than people who were not hungry. So reaching the right people at the right moment was very impactful for them. That said, there's a lot of talk about programmatic. It's taking off very strongly. But I think we do have to remember that even if you can reach a target audience perfectly, we have to really think about who is the, the, who is the true audience that you need to reach. So if you look at this, for example, we have the typical buyer distribution of an FMCG brand. So what we have is, on the left, uh, people who don't buy the brand very often. There's far more of those people than people who do buy the brand very often. So often brands can sometimes make a mistake of trying to target people they think really like them or their fans, and if they do, they're targeting a very small group of people. You only need to think about things like, in this case, beer in the UK. One in four beer drinkers in the UK are women, yet brands virtually never advertise beer advertising at women. Similarly, new cars, often advertisers are trying to reach young people, but in the US, 88% of new cars are bought by people over the age of 35. So it can be useful to reach a very particular audience using something like programmatic, but brands also really need to think about who am I trying to appeal to, who potentially might buy me at all, so that you don't end up missing and not advertising to people who actually could be purchasers of your product. So how do you know if you're reaching the right people? Well, at Ipsos, we've developed an app that we call MediaCell. The idea behind MediaCell is that uh, our respondents download the app to their smartphone that they carry around with them all the time. The app listens out for sound waves in advertising, and when it picks up a sound wave from a particular ad, it records it, and we know that that person's been exposed. We know what time they're exposed, where they're exposed, and how often. So primarily we're using it for TV. It can also be used for online video, where the sound is on, which is still a lot of online video, if not Facebook. And this is how it works. Um, the advertising that the client wishes to run this with, they identify it. We create a panel who download our app. We can survey them in advance, but we also encode the ad with the media agency. So we put an inaudible sound wave into the ad that the human ear can't pick up, but that our app can. The campaign goes live. We passively collect over the period of the campaign the level of exposure and frequency that that ad reached those people. And then at the end, we can research them. And that's where it gets really interesting to find out what was the impact of that ad. How did it affect them? So here's an example of a campaign that we looked at recently. You can see how when the campaign begins, the orange line is the level of reach, so the cumulative reach of the campaign. You can see how over about eight or nine weeks, it goes from zero to 77%. We know how many people were reached each, each week and at what frequency. This is a massive departure from what we've done in the past, where we've either had to ask people whether they remember ads, whether they recognize ads, or whether they watch the TV shows that ads might appear on. It's all based on memory. We no longer have to rely on human memory. We can use technology to tell us the answer. It allows us to do things like this. We know exactly when people were reached. We know that most people were reached in the evening, um, but also we did reach some people in the morning. We know on the table on the bottom how many times each person was exposed and which different demographic groups were exposed to what extent. So you can get very, very granular information on how that ad performed in terms of its reach and frequency. Then where it gets particularly interesting for us is where we survey people at the end to understand the brand impact. You don't have to understand all the numbers here, they're not all important, but the ones that are is that we had 29% of people who were just not exposed to the campaign. They had no passive exposure, they couldn't remember the ad. We also had on the right 13% of people who were exposed according to our app and were able to recall the ad. These guys had a big uplift in the brand scores versus the people that were not reached. So the column on the right versus the column on the left. The most interesting bit for us was that 55% of the sample did not remember being exposed to the TV ad, yet passively we knew that they had been. We knew that the smartphone app told us that person's been exposed. So for whatever reason, that ad did not stand out in their mind, not enough for them to be able to remember. But when we look at the results in terms of brand awareness, agreement with two brand image statements and the statement that they definitely or probably buy, they're significantly higher on those scores than the people who we know from the app were not reached at all. So what this is saying is that advertising can have an effect even if people don't remember seeing the ad. And in the past, we wouldn't have known that. We wouldn't have a way of knowing that. 
Now we know who's been reached, and we can tell whether the ad impacted them, even if they don't remember ever being exposed to that ad. So it can work in that kind of low involvement way. Advertising works like that. So we think with the acceleration of channels and devices, this sort of technology is really important. We're taking it further. We're taking it into digital as well, so we can pick up what people have been exposed to on their phones as well, in terms of um, online advertising. And just the very fact that there's so much stimulus out there means that we're moving away from a survey-based world of recall into this more technology-driven one. And then finally, measuring the metrics that matter. So I think you might recognize this guy. And I think this quote of his is very appropriate when it comes to online advertising. Not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. And this is really true, I think, online. There are so many statistics. There's so much data. There are so many analytics. We know that you can take any number and tell a story. You know, we got a billion impressions. OK, what does that mean? We got an 89% view-through rate. Right, but did it impact the brand? Did we sell any more product? It's easy to get bamboozled, bamboozled with statistics that may or may not mean anything. So we have to focus on the ones that we do think matter. The behavioral measures, the online web analytic measures, are important and they're useful, but we shouldn't rely on them on their own. We need to know how it affected people. We need to know if there was a brand impact. Ultimately, we need to know if there was a sale as a result of the online advertising. Click-through rates are still used a lot to judge the success of campaigns, even though click-through rates are now very small. Facebook told us that a majority of clients still use click-through rate to optimize campaigns. Yet, there's no relationship between the people who click on an ad and the people who go on to purchase a product. This is data from um, a study that looked at people who click on ads versus people who bought the products within those ads. And what it finds is that young people and older people tend to click on ads more often. And there are certain types of people within that. Certain people are just more clicky. They just click things more often. They click links and ads more often. It doesn't mean they go and buy products more often. And what we found was the products in those ads, they were more aimed at the 25 to 44 year old group. And yes, that was the people who actually bought them. So if you're trying to measure the success of a campaign based on its click through rate, it's the wrong metric. You'll optimize a campaign to the wrong choices and to the wrong metrics. This is backed up by Facebook as well. So Brad Smallwood, who's head of marketing science at Facebook, says, in 99% of the campaigns we've evaluated, the sales generated from online branding campaigns were from people that saw but did not interact with the ads. So they didn't immediately click. They didn't go and purchase, but they'd seen the ad. And when they were next in a store, or maybe two days later, they went online and purchased, the ad still had an effect. But the effect for the brand wasn't determined by the click. It was determined by what it did inside their head, what it made them think, that they were now more aware of the brand, and that next time they had an opportunity, they bought it. But it wasn't to do with the click-through. And even when it comes to other measures, so the view rates, this is data from a study that we did. So we served two ads live on Facebook. We looked at the view rates, so the percent of people who viewed each ad for three seconds or more. Ad A, the top ad, was viewed around half of people, 49% watched it for at least three seconds. But with ad B, only 39% did. So if that client had done what a lot of brands do, which is go, right, that means ad A is the best ad. It's the one people like the most. It's the one they watch the most. What we'll do is take the spend away from ad B, put all that money behind ad A, because it's clearly the best. They would have optimized the wrong metric. Ad B achieved 150% greater brand consideration amongst all those that were reached by either ad. So ad B was far more effective. And in fact, the reasons were relatively obvious. The brand appeared earlier. The product appeared earlier. It had more impact on brand consideration. The other one was more entertaining. It was more fun, but it didn't have any impact or not as much impact on the brand. So just measuring the behavior doesn't tell us the true impact. And the biggest issue, I guess, with digital metrics is that they tend to be very, very short term. They tell us what did someone do right now? Did they watch the ad? Did they click? What did they do next? It doesn't tell us what, how it affected them in their mind or what happened in the future. And there are so many metrics. It can be hugely confusing for brands which to use. So the Advertising Research Foundation lists 197 different uh, measures in their latest guide to digital metrics. 197 different ways to evaluate the success of a campaign, which really just sets itself up for whoever they wish to tell the story they wish. You can always find with that many metrics the right ones to tell the story you wish to tell. Whether it be the right one is a different question. 
And then when it comes to engagement, engagement is a, a phrase that's used a lot. And it's kind of been misused a bit in recent years. No one's quite sure what it does mean. The Internet Advertising Bureau tried to clear this up. And what they did, they formed a committee to agree on a definition of engagement. And they came back with 30 different metrics to define engagement. So again, it's just, there's so many metrics. We need to kind of look past this and focus on the things that really matter. So for us, there's really two roles of advertising. One is to create an immediate impact. And some campaigns, a lot of advertising is designed to do that. It's designed to have an offer or a new product launch, to have a direct impact and to have a purchase in the short term. So we need to understand, is there action off the back of that ad? Do people purchase it, the new product quickly? But a lot of advertising is also designed to work in a different way. It's designed to change the image of a brand you have in your head, to make you think about the, the brand in the long term. You know, car advertising would be a classic, but even in other categories. The reason that people often pay more for a brand is because it appears to be higher quality or it's something that they think is popular. Advertising can help get it there. It's not necessarily just trying to use an ad to get people to buy immediately. So we need to look at both sides, short and long term. And for us, we believe we need to combine all the different metrics together to look at the, the true answer. So that means, yes, the web analytics play a role. The behavioral data is important. But we also need to look at attitudes. How does advertising affect what people think? We would do that through surveys. And also combining that with registration and profile data to know who we reached and how they were impacted. Then finally, the most important thing, I think, is that when you're setting a campaign is to set your objectives and to think about which measures relate to those objectives. So for example, if the goal of a campaign is to achieve brand awareness, then things like impressions, the number of visitors, or reach of the campaign is really important, as is from surveys, brand and campaign awareness, ad recognition, and brand link. If, on the other hand, the idea behind the campaign is to achieve advocacy for people to recommend your brand, then metrics like retweets or shares or likes are important, or recommendation or NPS from surveys. So really thinking about metrics in terms of not just we've got all of these metrics to work with, but which ones matter in terms of the objectives that we actually want this campaign to achieve. So digital technology has transformed communication, but we believe the goal for brands remains the same, to activate a response in the short term and to build the strength of the brand in the long term. And we really believe digital can do both. And you can do that by making the first five seconds count, reaching the right audience, and measuring the metrics that matter. Thank you.